Okay, we're starting in the beginning. So, the previous Sedra, the previous Parsha dealt, right, with the commandments for the entire nations, so that we should be Kedoshim. And now the Chumash is going to focus on the Kedusha, the holiness of the Kohanim. Okay? So we begin with the verse that says that, that Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, speak to the Kohanim and tell them not to, what? Don't contaminate yourself to a dead person, except for relatives. And what type of relatives? So you can see it says mother, father, son, daughter, brother, and a sister that was not married. Right? Okay, only those can a regular Kohen, not a high priest, not a high, the Kohen Gadol. Only those are the type of people that he can be metamic, can be involved in their, in their burial. Okay? And there is one more, the, what's, one, what's, what's missing? We said mother, father, brother, sister. Right? We said and son. Or daughter. What's missing? Dog. Dog. Wife. Dog. Wife. Yeah. Wife. <laughs> yep. I guess you didn't read. It's wife. It seems not to mention the wife, but if you look, except for the relative who is closest to him, that refers to his wife. The relative that is closest to him is your wife. Why doesn't it just say wife? Then? Well, why do you think it doesn't say wife? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Well, well, I'm asking you. Specifically, says an unwed virgin sister, so his wife would be assumed to be wed and not be a virgin. Is it related to that? No, I don't think it's related to that. I wouldn't go that way. Who's your second? Yeah, right? She is, literally it means She'ero. She'ero is part of him. Mm. That is, that is, it's not just a cute little, you know, Dvar Torah that you give in a wedding. But really, that is the halacha, that a woman is a part of you. Your wife is a part of you. She'ero. Parents, it says, so it says, who is closest to him, then you get... But they're not as close as your wife. Right? Look at the Pasuk. The Pasuk tells us, right? Except for the relative who is closest to him, comma, right? To his mother and to his father and to his son, to his daughter and his brother and his virgin sister. Mother and father. You know, we're on camera here. Uh, let's uh, keep on moving. <laughs> of course counts. She's number one. That's why it says the relative that is closest to him. So you might think the relative closest to him is the father. It's mentioned. Closest to him is the mother. Mentioned. So that's a goldfish. A goldfish is not a relative. Are you sure? I don't know. What, maybe in some countries or states you're related to fish. The relative that's closest to him is not describing the list that follows. Correct. That's code for wife. Correct. Correct. Because the Torah is not redundant. There's no reason to give you a general category and then the specifics when it's obvious. Yes? Why do you need a code for wife? Is that because it's just about the strength of the relationship? Or is that and how close she is. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Next. Okay, we go, we continue. Now, they shall not make bald spots on their heads. Mine is natural, so don't laugh. <laughs> and they shall not shave the edge of their beard, and in their flesh shall not, they shall not cut a gash. What do all these things mean to you? Mourning. Correct. These are all things that they used to do when... They are in mourning for a dead person. 
But the Kohanim are not allowed to cause these sort of damages, for lack of a better word, on their bodies for signs of mourning. They're not allowed to do that. <coughs> we know of other nations, the pagans did that. That was part of their culture. Um, but here the Torah says, we don't do that. Why? So in verse 6 it tells us, they shall be holy to, the, to God, shall not desecrate the name of, Hashem, of God, for the fire offerings of Hashem, the food of their God, they offer, so they must remain holy. Okay? So, again, we continue with the code of holiness, that the priests have to reflect holiness in order to maintain their connection to Hashem. In the same way in the previous parsha, God says that you have to be holy for I am holy, so that in order for us to connect to Hashem, we have to reflect that holiness. Okay, so we're moving from the people to the priests. Next. Now we're told in verse 7, the laws regarding who can a Kohen marry and who a Kohen cannot marry. So it says to us, somebody read verse 7, please. They shall not marry a woman who is a harlot or has been desecrated. And they shall not marry a woman who has been divorced by her husband, for each one is holy to his God. Right, okay, so although Kohanim... Right? The Kohanim have um, they should get married. But we see that there's limitations on who they can marry. Right? So if you look on the footnote down here, which is a translation of what Rashi explains. So he says the definition of harlot is the one who is prohibited to a coin, means a woman who has lived with any man, a Jewish man, of course, was not permitted to her because of a negative commandment. Okay? So if she's not allowed to be with this person, then she is considered in this category and hence cannot marry a Kohen. What does lived with mean? Cohabitate. So we see limitations on whom a Kohen can marry. Okay? And we see that a daughter of a Kohen, later on in verse 9, if she cohabitates with a man without marriage, she has a special punishment. Oi. Yes. What's the oi punishment? Consumed by fire. Consumed by fire, burned. Yes. Right. That's a little harsh. Don't How many of you are learning Makos? I have a question. No, a bus, a bus. Once again. So we were reading in Makos, that's the, one of the early cases in the Gemara where two guys are trying to get a bad Kohen to burn. So they're saying that she slept, she was married, and she slept with another guy. And they want to get her burned, so we say even if she, you know, they try to get her burned, they don't get burned. Right? Malchus, why? And then the whole... Good. Yes, your question. A question. Uh, and the lady in Israel doesn't... doesn't really it's not slifa. It's a different punishment, but not slifa. Not slifa. Slifa is specifically... It's a chumrah that the Torah is telling us with regard to Kohen, because on a Kohen, there is a special type of Kedusha that he has by virtue of being a Kohen. Right? How does one get Kedusha then when you're looking at these rules? Mitzvahs. Excellent. That is how we achieve Kedusha. Mitzvahs that are limitations on our actions. Right? You can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can only do this, you can only do that, you can only do this. So when we have limitations on us, we become, we enter the category of holiness. Does that mean it's for that doesn't have a limitation on you, doesn't give you condition? I wouldn't say that. I'm saying if you look at the beginning of Parshat Kedoshim, where we learn the principles of holiness, Rashi says that we achieve holiness by following the commandments of the Torah. Where's that Kedoshim, just the previous one. Just the previous one. Just, it's worth looking at what? And Kedoshim is holiness. Kedo, Kedoshim is holy, okay. and Kedosh is holy, and uh, Kedusha is holiness. Kedusha. It's all from the root Kuf Dalet Shin. Kedush. It depends on what vowels you put on it. Right? You could put a A-O, so it's Kadosh. You could Kedusha, right? It depends on what the vowels that you're putting on. It'll change the meaning, but you're all within the boundary of Kiddush. Kiddush. Like, put the walk, like it's done, like completed, like it's 
sanctified? In the Islamic question, kadosh means holy. Sanctified. Yeah, sanctified. Yeah, correct. In A-O. Correct. Grammatically, yeah. yeah. It's like patuach. So... Yeah. That doesn't correct the issue that we have at hand. We, it doesn't change the fact that she. Yeah. So next time around. Right. So, Parshat Kedoshim, the first pasuk says, "Daber el kol adat bnei Israel, speak." to the entire assembly of the children of Israel, and say to them, you shall be holy, for holy am I, Hashem, your God. And then there's a list of mitzvahs, or laws. So Rashi says, heyu purushim Okay? So here it's described that, I just want to see if they translate exactly yeah, it's, they, good, they, they did this. Look at number two, you shall be holy. The root, Kadesh, connotes separation. Right? Separation. Right? You, you're making a boundary. Right? What's the difference between a Shabbos and a regular day? You make a separation on that day. Right? The Kiddush, the fact that when you make Kiddush, you take a cup of wine and say, today is, you light Shabbat candles, that separates one day from the other. It creates a barrier, a separation, a boundary. So he says, the root Kadesh connotes separation due to a difference in kind from something else. On one of this end of the spectrum, we have the sanctuary. It's called Kodesh, because it's different spiritual plane. On the other one, we have a moral person called Kadesh. He degraded himself and separated himself. So that's going to the other side. So he says, the injunction to be holy calls upon the Jews to avoid the illicit relationships uh, found in the previous chapter, so that wherever we find separation, right, we find that helps us uh, to reach holiness because we are removing ourselves from immorality. The Ramban, on the other hand, on Parshat Kedoshim, says that's not how you reach holiness. You reach holiness, and they explain this here. It's not limited to the observance of any particular category of mitzvahs. Rather, it's a call to one's approach to all aspects of life governed by moderation. Okay? So even in the areas where the Torah allows you to behave in a certain way, like, for example, kosher wine. Are you allowed to drink kosher wine? Yes. What about drinking a bottle of wine every night? <clears throat> that is overdoing it. Says who? It's coming Bernie, is that overdoing it? Like really good wine with nice dinner. I guess it depends on how good of a drink you have. Correct. Like you, can, you, you, know, you don't become drunk. Because that is against Jewish law. But you might say that that would be okay. The Torah says kosher wine. There's nothing wrong with it. But the Ramban says no. The Torah allows us lots of things. But it means that even within what the Torah allows us. Like yes, we're allowed to eat meat. Right? Flesh of cows. But don't be a glutton. Even with what God allows you to, make boundaries and say, you know, I'll have wine and Shabbos, because that's special. I know, yeah, I know I can eat it every night, but I'm going to make boundaries. So that is the idea of reaching holiness. Correct. Correct. So comes our Parsha and says, when we talk about Kohanim, since they are also supposed to be holy, we see there are more laws, there are more opportunities for separation, for immorality. There are more stringencies that we put on them to reach the Kedusha. And they have to, be main, they have to maintain the level of Kedusha. And we punish those who even try to affect their Kedusha, hence a daughter of a Kohen. Okay? Now, the Kohen Gadol in verse 10 so he says he doesn't mourn at all, even for his closest relatives. Just think how difficult that must be. Right? And where do we see this? In the Chumash? Some winners, some 
Aaron's sons died, right? And Nadav and Avihu passed away in Shmini, right? Parshat Shmini, a few weeks ago. And there he was silent. He couldn't mourn. He had to continue serving Hashem. Why? And this is a very, very important concept. Serving God, being in a level of Kedusha, is not just observing the commandments. There has to be a Muna behind it. What's a Muna? Belief in Hashem. By having the Muna that whatever God does is right, that we don't complain to God for what He does, that shows that we've reached a very, very high level. A Kohen Gadol, since he serves Hashem for the entire Jewish people, it's not just he's a private individual. He serves all. His emunah has to be so perfect that even when relatives die, he doesn't mourn for them. He understands that whatever God does, we don't question. We accept it because that is the will of Hashem. Yes? Isn't it a commitment to mourn? For us, but not for him. Huh. For us, for a regular Kohen. But not for a coin gadol. He cannot. Okay. Let's keep going. Now, then we talk in the Shani. We're in the second Aliyah, in verse Tedzain, which is verse 16. Yeah. No, no, back to Emor. So, says Hashem, somebody read verse uh, 16, 17. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aharon, saying, Any man of your offspring throughout their generations in whom there will be a blemish shall not come near to offer the food of his God. Correct. So what does that mean to you? I can't have this or any... Any blemishes. Yeah. A Kohen, a person who serves Hashem, has to be perfect. Visually, physically, morally for sure. Now, think about this. I, I, was, I taught um, last night this Parsha to uh, a group of college students, Israeli college students. And I used this example. Let's see if you, what you think of my example. And the idea is like this. If you have a guy back in America, right, figure high school, he is 6'3", well-built, good runner, good physique, good-looking guy, right? Great leadership qualities, 3.8, because you don't want to make 4.0, that will be too much. 3.89, you know. What would you tell, if you were his advisor, what would you tell him? Like, what should he do? Not for college, but in high school. Try out for sports. Do you go for the chess club? Go to the computer club, the cooking club. What, what do you tell them? Play basketball. Play basketball, play football, right? And he's really good in football. So what do you do? You make him quarterback. You make him the quarterback. You make him the... So now he's a role model. He's a role model. He is that, you see? What happens, in, in, at least in American culture, but it's also built on, if you look at the Greek model, the Roman model, a guy whose physique is perfect, this and that, you don't make him a priest. You make him a warrior. You make him a leader. You make him a fighter. Right? Who do you make of the priests? The Nebuchs. The scrawny guys that couldn't cut it, you know. Right, you make you take those guys, right? Who do you make the Kohen Gadol? The guy with the glasses or in the back of the class in the chess club with a pocket protector? No way. No way. The guy with a six-pack, right? <laughs> right. right. That's why all your rabbis have six-packs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's what I was wondering why. <laughs> <laughs> the idea, you see that the idea of the Torah, that if you're a winner, you serve Hashem. The other nations, if you're a loser, you serve the gods. Because if you're really good, if you're really this, then you are going to be a warrior. You could be fighting for fame, right? 
you're going to go for riches, you can get the prettiest girl in on the castle, you know, whatever, all the stories that we were familiar with in Western culture. This is not the Torah. The Torah says the guy who is perfect without any mum, with no, nothing wrong with him, this guy, we take him to represent us to serve Hashem. And not only that, when you get to verse, chapter 22, verse 18, where it talks about what are we going to offer to Hashem, what does it say there? Somebody help me. <clears throat> Speak to Aaron in verse 18. To his sons and to all the children of Israel and say to them, any man of the house of Israel and of the proselytes among Israel will bring his offering for any of their vows of, or their free will offerings that they will bring to Hashem for an elevation offering. Keep going. To be favorable for you it must be what? Unblemished. Unblemished. Yeah, you, you, you get all the rest. Yeah. Unblemished. You want to bring a gift to God? Don't bring me your, uh, you know, your hop along goat. You know, it's kind of like this. No, you take the most beautiful animal that God blessed you with and you bring that as a korban. It's the same idea. It's the same idea. There's a story in the Gemara in Bukhoros of a guy who, you know, said he was going to the temple. You know, in his town, everybody gets ready. And he's getting ready, and they say, like, you're going to the temple? Yeah, like this? Says, what do you mean? He says, you're not bringing, like, a korban with you? He says, you know what, okay, I'll bring something. He goes into his uh, cow, is the cow shed, and he's got two cows. He's got one that's kind of old, you know, like, ready to go. Like, you know what, I'll take her. And he takes her, and he starts to walk, and his neighbor's like, well, where are you going with the cow? He says, we're going to the temple. He says, what? You're bringing that to the temple? You have to bring the best that you have. This is the gift you want to bring to God? So, he's like, oh, you know, okay. So he goes back into the uh, cow shed, and he says, so I'll switch. Right? So I'll transfer the, the kedusha that I put on this one. I'll transfer it to the big cow, to the good cow. And he puts his hand on the little cow and puts it on the bad cow, and he switches, takes the cow, and he walks out. And his wife's like, where are you going with the cow? I'm going to Jerusalem. You can't take the good cow. You got to take the other cow. Oh, no, don't you tell me that because if I take that one, everyone's going to laugh at me. So I got to bring this cow. So he goes out and the neighbor's like, where are you going with the cow? He said, I'm going to the temple. Well, what happened to the other one? Oh, no, no, I transferred the holiness from that one to this one. He said, then you can't do that. You can't transfer holy. You made her holy. That one goes. You made this one holy. Guess what? Both of them are going. <laughs> and the poor guy goes to the temple with two cows. <laughs> it's in Why does the passage emphasize Aaron and his sons? Are the sons part of the? Uh, Where in what verse? Eighteen? Yeah, are, are the sons part of the Am Yisrael? Yes, but he's he's trying to tell them: don't think that you are special; that you can be makriv, you can offer things that are not perfect, right? Because he's giving the laws of the Kohen. Kohen, these are the laws for the Kohen, these are the laws of the Kohen, these are the laws of the Kohen, and says, these are the laws of the Kohen and everybody else. You can't bring animals that are, you know, second class, reject, right? You can't bring reject. We don't want rejects to serve Hashem. We don't want rejects to be offered as uh, sacrifices to the Kaddish Baruch Hu, we bring only the top. Why? Well, not okay. It sounds like a good idea, but why? Logically? Yeah. Uh, I would understand that he gave you everything. Might as well give him the best you have. Why? He's your God. He created you. He, I mean, you're offering something. You can't give him. Why not? Does he care? Out of respect. You think maybe it has something to do with he wants you to have a personal loss and you need to show that you've lost something or given something up that actually means something to you? Ah, uh, look at that. Where do we learn that from? Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Bernie made it into the Bible then. Because remember, remember going back to Genesis, to Bereshis, we have two brothers. 
Cain and Abel. What did they bring? They brought also sacrifices. Do you know the story of Cain and Abel? Yes. No? So there were two brothers. Mom and Pop was Adam and Eve, right? And they had two sons, Cain and Abel. And Cain was what? A vegetable. A farmer. He was a vegetable. vegetable. He was a vegetable. vegetable. (laughs) (laughs) First case in history of a vegetable killing somebody else. And you broccoli's bad. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Broccoli's one of my favorite... Uh, don't make fun of broccoli no. or cauliflower. No, broccoli and cauliflower. Cauliflower has no nutritional value. Whatsoever. Listen up. You, t- you touch my cauliflower, you are... Oh, don't, don't worry about me touching your cauliflower. I'm not going near that. <laughs> You're out of the Shabbaton then. <laughs> Nobody touch anybody's cauliflower. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Boundaries. That's what I have to say in the kid when I drive it to the kids. Boundaries, no touchy. No touchy. Okay. Cain and Abel were brothers. And Abel was um, a shepherd. And Cain was an agriculturalist. He was a farmer. And they made an offering to God. And the the Torah says that God accepted and favored uh, Abel's uh, sacrifice, what he brought, his gift, and not Cain. And the story the rabbi tells that Cain was jealous of Abel. He invited him out to the, you know, outside, you know, in the field, and attacked him, and then eventually killed him. And that's the first murder in human history, which was genocide, right? Killing 50%, I mean, one quarter of all humanity died that day. It's terrible. And what do we see? That Abel, the Chazal, rabbis tell us that Abel brought the choicest of fruits, the most beautiful fruits he brought. Sorry, most beautiful sheep most beautiful lambs, that's what he brought to Hashem and offered them. Cain brought, like, ah, I got this rotten tomato, this banana didn't come out right. You know, I'll bring some stuff, here's stuff, here you go. Doesn't work that way. You have to bring your best. If God blessed you with something, that which he blessed you with, you should use to serve him. Because that's what the reason he gave it to you. God gave you a brain, you should use your brain to serve him. Just because, you know, people say, you know, but isn't it like the Torah, you just do what it says? No. God gave us a brain. That's why we sit and learn so many hours. Because you have to use your brain. Does it make sense? Ask questions. If the answer doesn't make sense, push back. You serve Hashem with whatever he gave you. He, whatever you have, he gave it to you for a reason. If you're not happy with something in your life, right? you have to be aware that it's there for a reason. It's not by mistake. Ah, but I caused it myself. Yeah, you did. But there is divine providence. God is with you. So when, you, when Hashem is giving the laws to the Kohanim and to Bnei Israel, he's telling us, When you serve God, you do it with the most perfect. Okay? All right. Let's double back and then keep going. So it tells us that any coin with a mum, with some blemish, cannot serve Hashem. Very, very different than our American culture because we learn not to discriminate people with disabilities, why, you know, this is not fair. It's not about that. It's not about that. God set up the criteria, and this is what he says. And that's it. Fairness is, the, is not what God shoots for. God shoots for justice. They're not the same. It's like people always say, you know, people want vengeance. And if they can't get vengeance, they'd rather have justice. First, everybody wants vengeance. But since you can't get vengeance, then you're like, okay, let justice be served. If you could, you'd probably, you know, hang people on trees. But she says you can't do that. Then you say, yeah, fine, we'll have justice. We'll have justice take its course. Until that doesn't work, and then there's rioting. Vengeance can be justice. What? Vengeance can be justice. Uh, It it might be a form of justice. But vengeance is best served cold. Verse 1 in chapter 22 
here we begin to see if a Kohen somehow gets impure, right? How that would work. Okay? So it's, we learn about a Matsura or a Zav, right? Or if he touches anyone who's contaminated by a corpse or something else, which I'm sure you can read on your own, or a man who touches any swarming thing, right? All these are all the type of contaminants that we learn in previous parshiot that we learn about the laws of Tuma and Tahara. And we see them applied to a Kohen. So when a Kohen becomes Tame, right? He cannot eat from the Kochim. That's what it says. Cannot eat. There he may eat from the holy food. Before that he cannot, right? So verse 6, he says, he shall not eat from the holies, right, from the sacrifices, unless he has immersed his body in uh, water, and after the sun has set, he shall become purified. Okay? So he needs to go to the mikveh, and then wait till sundown, and then he can eat. Right? How many of you are learning brachot? Right, so the beginning of Brachot talks about this idea. The beginning, the first Mishnah in Brachot talks about this idea. But not from this parsha, from a different parsha. Uh, you no, know, in this parsha, in verse 7. He tells us that he shall not eat from carcass, from torn animal, right? Because he will become tame. He will, again, not bear any sins, right? And then it tells us also the other way. That a lay person shall not eat kochim. Again, we see boundaries. Because through boundaries, we are able to reach holiness. Through maintaining, through following the boundaries, we thereby limit our physicality. And if you remember from the class that we did on Der Hashem and Mesilat Yesharim, the body and soul are like a seesaw. If you give into your body, then your spirituality goes down. If you give in to your spirituality, then your body goes down. If you control your body, then your spiritual side gets stronger. If you give in to your spirituality, then your body gets weaker. That's how it works. It's a seesaw. And here we see from the Torah that we have all these laws of Tumas that when we are able to control the body and the desires of the physicality, we reach higher and higher levels of Kedusha, and therefore, higher and higher levels of connection to Hashem. And therefore, we are doing what we're supposed to do. See you tomorrow. Mm-hmm.